Hello and welcome to the second season of Sunday Stories Live, brought to you by the 1947 Partition Archive, a non-profit, non-governmental organization that has its roots globally. The 1947 Partition Archive works tirelessly to preserve the nearly lost oral histories of partition and has documented the life stories of more than 9,700 witnesses to the South Asian partition of 1947. The Oral History Project is the largest of its kind in South Asia. And with immense passion and dedication, they have made it possible to preserve unique stories in about 750 different cities and villages across 18 countries. Sunday Stories is an ongoing event series that will bring to you academics, scholars, oral historians, musicians, artists, and personal stories of people who live through partition. Like the name suggests, it takes place every Sunday at the same time. So be sure to tune in. My name is Sonam Kaldra. I'm a musician with my very own personal interest and body of work on partition. And today, I have the absolute honor to be in conversation with award-winning eminent historian, Professor Raj Mohan Gandhi. He is a biographer, a research professor at the Center for South Asian and Middle Eastern Studies, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in the United States. He's the author of more than a dozen books. He's a biographer involved in efforts for trust building and reconciliation. He is a peace builder and also the grandson of Mahatma Gandhi. Professor Gandhi, we are so, so happy and honored to have you here with us. Personally, I'm thrilled um, to be able to have this chat with you. Your depth of knowledge on South Asian history, it's so incredible. And we, we really, what we so admire about your book, Punjab, a history from Aurangzeb to Mount Batten, is that you present so many competing perspectives which bring in the objectivity that is perhaps so badly needed today and is missing. We all know that history is being changed and um, rewritten. So I think this is just the sort of history we need to preserve. It's also the sort of objectivity we need to foster so that we can have a greater understanding for the future, a greater understanding between people. Your book has great detail. It's an original research and it's truly an eye-opener for so, so many of us. Thank you and welcome to Sunday Stories. Uh, thank I, you. No, please go ahead. I was thanking you, Sonamji, for those kind words. It's, I'm utterly delighted to be having this conversation with you. And I want to also greet anybody and everybody who has joined. And I hope that uh, at some point, those who have joined may also read this book. It was written some years ago published in 2013. It's the story of Punjab from uh, the death of Aurangzeb, 1707, to the partition of 1947. So it covers only a 240-year period in Punjab. So amazing, amazing long history. Uh, and yes, I do, I do try to bring uh, several viewpoints into, into telling the story. And, but, you know, no, no historical work can be complete or utterly accurate or utterly impartial. So many things get into telling a story. So I would like everyone to do their own research and write their own stories. But if uh, my book can encourage them in their research, I would, of course, be very, very uh, glad. I'm sure it will. I mean, I think that there's so much knowledge in your book, so many li little different stories, and we'll get to them as we go along. And I have so many questions. I wish this was a three-hour session, but unfortunately it's not. So I'm going to try and touch upon all of them. Partition, the partition of 1947, and many people don't even still realize something as basic as the fact that it was still date the greatest mass displacement in the history of humanity. And those scars have still not healed. My own family is from Rabalpindi and Sargoda, and I've had the good fortune of going back to Pakistan, not back to Rabalpindi, but it's been incredible. But I'm so intrigued. What made you, Professor Raj Mohan Gandhi, want to cover Punjab? I mean, you wrote amongst many, many things, but your history of Punjab feels like perhaps it was written for personal reasons. Could you expand on this? Could you tell us how old you were when partition happened? And also, the impact it had on you. 
and being in having so much access to first hand information because of your grandfather i mean this it's a multifold question but if you could sort of all put it all together and explain to us why punjab what was it about punjab that made you want to write about punjab and partition thank you so uh, i'll begin with the fact that i was 12 in the year 1947 uh and by august 15 47 i was fully 12 uh and um, i was going to school in uh, new delhi my father was a journalist he was an editor of the Hindustan, he was the editor of the hindustan times um one of the things that uh, happened in the year 47 was that uh in some ways the character and composition of my school changed the school to which i went uh, had very few punjabis before 47 it had uh, people from various parts of delhi but some other parts of, of india there was a bengali influence also in my school but with partition uh, uh, some of the muslim boys there were not many muslim uh, students in my school but from one day to the next they all had seemed to vanish and before long uh, some hindu punjabi and sikh punjabi boys joined the school uh, one or two muslim teachers also seemed to disappear we had houses and there was a house called akbar house to which i happened to belong and in the 47 atmosphere the name akbar house was dropped um, and of course as uh, my father was the editor of hindustan times and we lived in an apartment uh, above the hindustan times editorial offices and printing press so a lot of what was going on in the country it was also entering our apartment our home our conversation and my grandfather my father's father was frequently in, in delhi from 46 to 48 not continuously but he spent many longish periods there so uh, i was aware of all that i was aware of the fact that at his prayer meetings multi faith prayer meetings held in the open air open to the public uh, sometimes some persons objected to the very short recitation from the opening chapter of the quran that was also part of this multi faith prayer meeting and most of the time the objections were withdrawn when my grandfather asked the people to withdraw the objection but there were moments when their objections were not withdrawn and so i was aware of the of the depth of passion uh, and happiness that many of the sikh and hindus would come from pakistan to india at the time for their nurses and their hearts uh, and then of course i had the privilege of having many punjabi friends also my father's friends and my own friends there was an amazing lady called bibi amtus salam she was from rajpura Uh, and she was a very close family friend of all of us she was one of gandhi's associates um there were also, there was uh, some of you have heard of pyare lal nayar gandhi's close associate who also wrote his biography he was with gandhi from 1919 uh, to 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 the end and beyond and his sister sushila nayar right so so apart from the fact that i had this personal acquaintance and friendship with many wonderful punjabis and they changed in my school uh, and then uh, uh, i was i was like everybody who grew up at that time was aware of the upheaval that partition had caused so i wanted to understand it and fairly soon i realized that just to look at the immediate preceding years so 47 was not enough to understand partition that i should look at a longer history Uh, so that is why i wanted to go back and go back so i decided that maybe i would go as far back as aurangzeb uh and then continue the story from his death because i knew that uh, when aurangzeb died in 1707 that was the start of the withdrawal of mughal influence from many parts of india but especially punjab so as the mughal empire retreated uh there was a power vacuum and eventually before long it was filled by the sikhs and that was another amazing story you know there was the mughals uh, and then 
eventually the British, British came, but in between there was an amazing period for 70, 80 years where the Sikhs ruled most of Punjab. Uh, and, and one of the questions in my mind was, uh, Mughals have, this, uh, have left uh, Punjab, but the majority in Punjab, especially in Western Punjab, but if you took undivided Punjab as a whole, the Muslims were a majority. Well, okay. In undivided Punjab, 55% uh, uh, or so. So, uh, and this was more or less the case even earlier. In fact, when Babar arrived in India in 1520s, already the, uh, the uh, Sultanate had been in Delhi for some time. But already by this time, uh, what we know of as undivided Punjab, and not just Indian Punjab today, but if at some point I hope that we can see on the screen a map of undivided Punjab. And but can we pull that up? Yeah. There you go. It's the yeah. cover of your book. Yeah. Yes. So you know, you know, this this undivided Punjab looks almost like a butterfly, and and and, and the western half eventually became Pakistan, and the eastern half India. Then India was divided into Himachal and Haryana and and Indian Punjab. Uh, but already when Babar came in the 1520s, uh, this undivided Punjab, taken as a whole, had a Muslim. Majority. And yet, uh, so when the Mughal Empire ended, uh, began to end, and uh, Aurangzeb died, there's a vacuum in Punjab, and but it's filled not by the leaders of the Muslims of Punjab who are a majority. Mm. It's not filled by the Hindu community who are the next largest group, but the vacuum is filled by the Sikhs. The Sikhs run Punjab for 80 years. So the Mughals and the Sikhs and then the British. So one of the questions I try to answer in my uh, study is, how come that the Sikhs filled the vacuum and nobody else did? Anyway, so those are those are some of the questions that. Uh, that is really, it's so, so interesting. interesting. Yeah. I seem to have got an echo. Can you can you hear me as well with an echo? Let me try and wear this. I able to hear you. Yeah. So the next question that I'm going to ask you is, I'm going to quote from your book, where you write not to recognize that the Punjab that was, or to imagine that Punjabi history started only in 1947, is to erect in India and Pakistan both a granite wall between our lives and those of our grandparents, and thus ensure a failure to understand ourselves. Your book, as you've just been saying, is very uniquely about undivided Punjab rather than Indian Punjab. So would you explain to us why you wanted to write? I'm going exactly from because it's so interesting. Why did you want to write about this undivided Punjab? And why do you feel it's important to understand this undivided entity to then go on to understand partition? You know, people like yourself, you have related your personal story. You are aware that uh, before 47, Lahore, for instance, had a very substantial Sikh and Hindu population. You are aware that Rawal Pindi had a very significant Hindu and Sikh population, Multan, and all the other places now in Pakistani Punjab. But you know, uh, many in Indian Punjab have forgotten, completely forgotten, that city of Jalandhar, city of Ludhiana, had Muslim majorities. That Amritsar, Amritsar in the mid 40s had 47% Muslims. Amritsar. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, for us not even to realize that this is what was happening uh, just a few months before partition, uh, that uh, what is today Pakistani Punjab was a Yes, Muslim majority, but there were so many Sikhs and Hindus. What is today India's Punjab or India's Haryana, India's Himachal? Yes, it may have, the Punjab may have a Sikh majority. Haryana and Himachal may have Hindu majority. But it was not just Maler Kotla, but all of Punjab, all of Haryana, all of Himachal, there were so many Muslims living there. And this was... And yet, the, yeah. Sorry, just taking from what you're saying, I mean, in both these comments, both the answers you've given, you've spoken of how the Muslims were the majority, and yet I don't hear from what you're saying that they were in any way imposing 
their faith perhaps or imposing there, there didn't seem to be any strife really or perhaps there was and that you'll explain to us but it doesn't sound like it from what you're saying it sounds like you know if the six were allowed to rule even though they were the smallest group it sounds like everyone was living in a fair amount of harmony uh, well i think that would be um, rather a, a attractive picture to believe in <laughs> there's more to it more to more to harmony it, the reality was that the six managed to rule punjab not yeah. because everybody wanted the six to rule necessarily right. uh, right. but the six uh, uh, so you know uh, if you look at the longer history of punjab even before the mughals before the, uh, the, the sultanate uh, you know, punjab was the place that so many invading armies came across to and through uh, and 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 then later on also punjab saw a lot of strife there was a great uh, the Af afghans were often coming into into punjab uh, of course the mughals were ruling from delhi so it isn't as if uh, there was complete harmony throughout uh, there was stability during mughal rule it's very important to realize this is very important you know what stability does is something very important to recognize uh, the mughals uh, did bring stability to punjab whatever the disagreements and unhappiness there was a cause you know uh, the, the the execution of some of the gurus of this, it was a yeah. it was a very yeah. major traumatic event and then the killing of the last guru's sons I, right what could be more traumatic than that so there were deep deep issues but remember that uh, this uh, sikh rule of 80 years or so took place after after those events and so uh, it isn't the, the the reality is that because of of insecure life for centuries what the punjabis the punjabis and i'm speaking now of the muslims and the hindus and the sikhs what the punjabis treasured most was some kind of security some kind of stability some kind of peace that is what they wanted but uh, after aurangzeb died and then there was instability the only group Look, the Punjabi group that was determined to run things were the Sikhs. Uh, the Muslims were not. The Hindus were not. They wanted peace and stability, but this business of controlling and running and ruling and establishing a, you know, that was left to the Sikhs. So that is a, a very important part of the story. Uh, but having recognized that there was a good deal of tension and a good deal of conflict over time it is also true that simultaneously there was amazing coexistence and of course what we must recognize is before even guru nanak baba farid's time this notion that beyond hindu beyond muslim beyond a religious religious label we are human beings and of course guru nanak was all uh, right bolle shah guru nanak i mean so So, so many poets at the time. Yes. yes. Yeah. So, so what I'm saying is that, uh, or, or maybe I should say that during the Sultanate time, there were the Sufi masters. During the Mughal time, there were the gurus. So there was this pattern uh, in history too, uh, and so to kind of offset it quite interestingly to offset the regime in many ways there was the, yes. the philosophers and the the other leaders the spiritual leaders but not the kinds that we see today no, um, no, no. and then to call them just spiritual leaders is also inadequate they gave yeah, right. new, new thinking to the i think mentors yeah right the community they were teachers they were friends teachers. they were, they were gurus. guides yeah. uh, and so uh, there yes there was a rule there was political rule but then society was also guided by these amazing personalities the sufis the gurus people like that it sounds like a wonderful i mean despite as you say being ruled very tightly there was space for free thinking and allowing them to have liberal ideas which is really really important as you say to create a counterpoint for this kind of rule as well for those of you who are just joining you're watching sunday stories live from the 1947 partition archive this is season 2 and with us is professor raj mohan gandhi is our first guest of this season and we're having an incredible conversation with him uh professor gandhi this you talk of you know 1707 i think you said from aurangzeb stand now why did you feel that understanding punjab's history stretching all the way back to that time 
is necessary for understanding both India and Pakistan in their present day. And talk to me a little bit about this concept of Punjabi. I've heard you speak about it a couple of times. I love the notion. I love the idea and how you talk of how it bonded a land together. Here you say that, you know, all of them live together in a certain coexistence. This was a land, as you said, rooted in, in also in culture. And I still feel when I went back to Pakistan or even when I we, we find ourselves quoting so much Amrita Pritam, Bulle Shah, um, you know, Varis Shah. I mean, there's there's so much stuff that is still so common. The land is the same, the, the, the food is the same. So it's really hard to still, in so many ways, feel that there is a difference. And so talk to me about this lovely Punjabi, this beautiful thought, at least to my mind and my layperson's understanding of it. Uh, well, you know that uh, at the root of Punjabi is the Punjabi language. The language is such a binding, uh, bonding, uniting force. And, and so the poets and the playwrights and the singers, uh, so of all, uh, whether they are Muslim or Hindu or Sikh, so, so there, there is something absolutely amazing through the language. And this language has been there for such a long time. Such a long time. You know, many people don't realize that actually uh, Punj uh, Punjabi uh, uh, played also a large part in the development of the Hindi language. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so this too is worth recognizing. So, I think people think it went the other way. Yes, yes. People they think from Hindi came Punjabi. I mean, I think that 19, yes. I can speak for like 90% of the people who would say, oh, really? <laughs> yes. So, so this too is historically. It is. It is true that uh, uh, Hindustani or you know the kind of Hindi that people speak in the Delhi area or around the Delhi area grew as a result of a combination of Punjabi and Persian and, and so forth. Of course, there was already uh, local languages which had been derived from Sanskrit in the area. All these uh, historical roots played the part, but. Uh, anyway, this is worth recognizing the, the power and the impact and influence historically of the, of the Punjabi language. Uh, I've already mentioned this, uh, the Sufis and the Gurus um, and, and the poets. Uh, and also worth recognizing is that as you know, the Sultanate comes and then the Mughals come and then the Afghans try to come and the Sikhs rule and then the British come, but through all this time, the common people are facing all kinds of problems, and these are similar problems. So whether you are a Sikh or a Hindu or a Muslim, you are facing similar problems. So there is a kind of uh, commonness, unity, and adversity, which also contributes to the development of Punjabi. And of course, we know that uh, so, so many uh, important Muslims and Hindus were in Ranjit Singh's kingdom. Uh, so when Sikhs were ruling, uh, and even the various Muslim principalities across uh, undivided Punjab, I'm not speaking during the Mughal time or even before the Mughal time, uh, the Muslim Nawabs and Muslim chiefs in different parts of what say today's Pakistan Punjab, all had many Hindu and Sikh uh, officers. Um, incidentally, uh, some of the leaders of uh, Pakistani Punjab today in some, in some some cases, their forebears were officers in Ranjit Singh's Punjab. Okay. So there there was this there is this continuity which also explains some kind of uh, commonality and unity beyond religion. But you believe that it's important for us to understand this to talk of the future of India and Pakistan or to talk of where we are at present. Of course, I mean. I mentioned my boyhood and my Punjabi friends, and my awareness that there was a much bigger Punjab than the Punjab and Haryana we today know. Yeah. So uh, don't we all want to know what life was like during our grandparents' time, our great-grandparents' time, what we yeah. spoke about? And without knowing that, we, don't, we can't understand ourselves. That is why I say that without... Uh, recapturing the Punjab that was the undivided Punjab, which also had so, so many great qualities. It had uh, fantastic agriculture. It had amazing schools, colleges. It had, uh, uh, so it had, it had some wonderful things to be proud of. 
So we should be aware of that. And then we will understand today uh, in a better way. I think Ali Sardar Jafri, I mean, I'm reminded of a poem, one of the lines where he says, Ye des dosto ka, yaro ka, gham guzaro ka, aashik, ka, be kararo ka. And he describes it as a land of dildar people, of people who literally wore their hearts on their sleeve and, and they just... Yes. You know, they worked hard, they toiled hard. As you said, they had this unifying language, which is so incredible across religion to have this unifying language. And therefore, perhaps, like you said, they coexisted, which is a beautiful thought. But I also love what you said when in one of your interviews and I was reading where you said, I want the Indian pa Punjab to know the Pakistani Punjab, which is now the Pakistani Punjab, because at one point it was the undivided Punjab. But what is so interesting also is that you say in your book that Punjab was the pride of British India. Yeah. It was the most fertile. You've talked of how uh, most of the soldiers, I think, from in their army, in the British army, were from the Punjab and they won many wars. The nationalist movement, surprisingly, was the least active in Punjab. And you say that it was literally the, one of the most pro-empire parts of the country. Yeah. So then it is so interesting, perhaps, and, and strange that why was Punjab then partitioned? How and why did this land of love and friendship turn into such a scene of massive bloodshed and torture, you know? And what happened? What caused this sudden change? I mean, from the British sort of loving Punjab and being okay with it, and it was it loved the British in many ways. It, you know, I mean, they followed, they towed the line in some ways. And what happened? What caused this sudden massive eruption? That's a great question, and one way to uh, uh, try and answer it is to recognize that uh, the British did achieve some remarkable things. We can't deny it. You know, we, we yeah. all are very proud Indians. We are proud of the independence movement. Uh, we're absolutely delighted that the British uh, were compelled to leave. Yes. But, but they did, in Punjab uh, and elsewhere too, but especially in Punjab, did some, some remarkable things. So that is, should, should be recognized. Stability was one. Uh, roads and canals uh, were another very major thing, and schools and colleges and hospitals and, and jails. Uh, you know, uh, even before that, uh, often mutilation was punishment. You know, not, not. so. Uh, yes, we have to look at uh, the, the the district administration, the deputy commissioner, the district collector in each district, at least in theory and often in practice, was often really. Uh, understanding the peasants' problems, uh, all the local problems in villages. So yeah, there were some remarkable things. However, 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 it's very important to recognize two things about British rule. One, they ruled Punjab as a superior race. They wanted to establish that we are the rulers, all the Indians are inferior people. So ruling as a superior race was an important aspect of British rule. And the second important aspect was that we will get the Muslims to be close to us, British. We will get the Sikhs to be close to us, the British. We will get mm -hmm. the Hindus to be close to us, the British. But we will erect walls between the Muslims and the Sikhs and the Hindus. So the divide and rule theory, right? They should, they should, everyone should have a good communication and link and a bridge to us. But there should be no road, no bridge between the Hindus and Sikhs. And Muslims. this was very important. And many Hindus and Sikhs and Muslims fell for this, absolutely fell for it. And it seems to be happening, sorry to interrupt you, but it yeah. seems to be, be this, as a, as a people, perhaps sometimes I feel that we're so fickle. It's so, we fall so quickly for these divisions and if only we could be stronger. It seems to be happening since 1947, till date. And, and uh, ab absolutely. Now, uh, as, as I think many scholars have recognized, many students wish to recognize it, one of the remarkable things of the Indian nationalist movement, the, you might call it the Gandhi-led nationalist movement, right. was that for substantial periods of time, substantial sections of the population, for the time being at least, forgot their religious divides, and Hindus and Muslims and Sikhs and Christians and everybody all came together in many parts of India. Now, right. in, in Punjab, that did not quite happen, although culturally, linguistically, there was Punjabiyat. But in mm. politics, the six Muslims and the Hindus of Punjab all seemed, many of them, determined to pursue their own separate independent paths. 
And uh, so another way of looking at it is, say, you know, uh, there was uh, Patel in Gujarat, there was Jawaharlal Nehru in UP, there was uh, Rajgopala Chari in, in South India, uh, Rajendra Prasad, Jayaprakash Narayan in Bihar. But in Punjab, although Gandhi had some wonderful, I mentioned Parallel Nair, Amtus Salam, Rajkumari Raj Amrit Kaur was from a Sikh background. Right, right, yeah. From Kaputula. But Gandhi didn't quite have in Punjab a, a, a comrade, a colleague mm -hmm. who had the trust of all the communities right. in Punjab. To be able to influence them, right? So, so Punjab somehow did not, uh, despite Punjab yet, politically, that kind of uh, political leadership that commanded the loyalty of all the three main communities in Punjab, somehow that did not happen. I mean, Lala Lajpat Rai was a phenomenal figure, uh, very courageous, but he, he never tried to, he never had any significant Muslim follower. So the examples like that. Uh, so why that happened or why, why that kind of leadership did not happen is a separate question, but to recognize the fact that we, we didn't have that kind of, that was contributed also to both to the partition that happened. Uh, there's one other detail that I think I should mention, uh, Sonam Jivichi, because most people have forgotten it. That in the, uh, in, during the British time, it started in 1849. You know, that is when the British took over. After 80 years of Sikh rule, the British had about, about 100 years of British rule. So fairly soon, they had many uh, uh, innovations, schools, colleges, and so forth. Um, and as it happened, uh, the Sikhs uh, were, of course, above all in the farming area, but there were many, some Sikhs in the cities too. But, but it is the Hindus who were most successful in entering the schools and colleges and getting British English education and getting into government jobs. Okay. And in the best colleges of Punjab and in the government departments where Indians could be admitted, there was a preponderance of Hindus to some extent Sikhs, but a very small minority of Muslims. So even in the government departments and in medical colleges, other colleges, the Muslim percentage was very small. And, you know, we all talk about reservations today in other parts of India, but people have completely forgotten that one very big reason for the failure of the nationalist movement to really roar forward in Punjab was that the Hindu and perhaps to some extent Sikh leaders of uh, Punjab opposed the idea of any kind of encouragement or reservation for Muslims in colleges and government departments. And the, uh, the big leader, Muslim leader, who to begin with was out of the nationalist movement, a man called Fazli Hussain, very important figure, Sir Fazli Hussain. To begin with, he was a tremendous nationalist. He wanted to fight for freedom. He took part in some of the earliest Satyagrahas in Punjab in 1990, 1920. But before, but soon he, the empire took him, gave him, made him a knight. And right. He fought for reservation for Muslims in colleges and government jobs. And the Hindu leaders of Punjab absolutely opposed this. They said, we have got these government jobs because of our own efforts. Uh, we don't want now so you know, the, the word used in those days was weightage. The weightage should be given to the, minor, to the to those who are underrepresented. So Muslims should have some weightage. And so the unwillingness of the Congress leaders, who are majority Hindu leaders in Punjab, to recognize this great desire of the Muslims also to educate and to be. In, yeah. So this was a very major factor that alienated the Muslim community from the Sikh and Hindu communities and eventually led also to partition. I was just going to ask you the next question, which was through your research, what did you discover as to why you think partition occurred, not just in Punjab and Bengal, but of course you're covering it. But is there anything more you'd like to tell us? Because I'm sure there's so many other 
Um, no, that's a, such a big story. It is very huge. Big. I know we have to try and cover so much <laughs> ground in so little some, time. Some, some major points, and especially points that are under recognized. I think I, 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 sh I should mention. You know, one question that is asked is in really re relating to partition. A, why was partition inevitable? And if it was, could it not have been organized in a more orderly fashion? Yeah. yeah. And if, if also people wanted uh, West Punjab to be solely Muslim and East Punjab to be so entirely non-Muslim, could not have sort of transfer of population in within Punjab been arranged peacefully. So no, uh, that could not happen because there was no agreement on where the boundary should be. You can't say that we can have a peaceful transfer if you don't agree on where the boundary should be. Right. So many Sikhs and Hindus felt that Lahore had to belong uh, to, you might say, non-Muslim India. Uh, many in today's Pakistan, at that time, you know, I told you that 47% of Amritsar was Muslim. They said, well, Amritsar also should belong to Pakistan. Pakistan. And right. you know, during the British time, British Punjab was divided into divisions. There were three divisions in West Punjab, Rawalpindi Division, Lahore Division, Multan Division, and there was Jalandhar Division and Ambala Division in Indian Punjab. Uh, but Amritsar belonged to the Lahore Division, <laughs> you know, so yeah. at that time. Uh, Lahore and Amritsar are so close to each other. My goodness, the life of Lahore and Amritsar was absolutely interconnected. And, 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 and you know, this is one of the one of the concrete examples of the tragedy of passion is is to create this separation between Amritsar and Lahore. Right. <laughs> it just feels like that they I mean, even in contemporary yes. it, now. I mean, I when I went and I crossed, firstly that line feels very surreal. You feel you have one. You just draw a line through the hearts of somebody's of people through a family, and one foot is on one side and the other on the other side, and when you go to Lahore, you you haven't you don't feel like you've left Amritsar in any way. You don't feel like you've left Delhi. Exactly. There are so yeah. many similarities. Yes. There's a young poet, and I'll just share this with you, who'd written this beautiful poem. He says, Kash kal subhe jab aankh masalte huye darwaza kholu, to dehlis ke us taraf khada ho dusra mulk. Na darare, na diware, na shikayat. Bas ijazat ek kamre se dusre kamre tak jane ki. And I loved how he described it as two rooms in one house, which is really how you're saying it as well. It's just, I, 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 I mean, I think that's one of the greatest regrets that so many people have. And there is that beautiful march that happens on the 14th of August. I think that citizens get together on either side of Vaga and they have a candle candlelight vigil and a march. and. But please carry on. I was just digressing because you inspired me to please tell me. To, so, so you know, one other very important factor, uh, for good or for ill, the Congress Party in Punjab was essentially a Hindu party. There were some Muslims, there were some Sikhs, but it was essentially a Hindu party. Uh, uh, and the Sikhs had more than one party. The Akali Party came at some point, but there were some other parties also. Uh, but they, they, these were Sikh parties. There were some remarkable peasant parties among the Sikhs too, which is worth noting. Now the Muslims of Punjab were for a long time in the Unionist Party. The Muslim right. League was a later development in Punjab. Right. And the Unionist Party uh, had uh, Muslims, it had Sikhs, it had Hindus. Uh, it had two negatives to it. It was pro-empire and it was it is led by some rich landlords. It was, you might, you might call it a feudal party. So you might say, all right, pro-empire, pro-feudal, two very large negatives. But it had one amazing positive. It was a Punjabi party of Sikhs, Hindus, and Muslims. Yeah. Now, if only the Congress had managed to build bridges with the Unionist Party in Punjab, the whole story would have been different. And this did not happen. It did not happen for two reasons. Progressives in the Indian Congress, you know, call them left-wing, call them socialistic, call them progressive, whatever. Very anti-feudal, very, they said, we can have no truck with this feudal party. <laughs> so that was one problem. And 
Also, uh, they, many of the Hindus in the Punjab Congress, local leaders of the Punjab Congress said, no, no, this uh, the Unionist Party, they want reservation for Muslims. It's a Muslim party. So we can't have a real partnership. Uh, and you know, Gandhi tried from, dist from distance two or three times to build some bridges with the Unionist Party because he was able to. But the, he, this, this could not succeed. The progressives nationally and the Hindu Congress leaders within Punjab, no question of any negotiation. Eventually, as people know, those have read history, that eventually there was a Unionist Sikh Congress coalition led by Khizar Hayat Khan in 45, 46. Uh, uh, but it was too late in the day. Okay. Yeah. And, and, by, and by this time, that the Muslims were able to paint Khizar as a stooge of the Hindus and Sikhs. And, they, they, and one day, one of his children said to his father, uh, Papa, school mein log kehte ki aap to musalman nahi hai. And so he resigned. Uh, okay. So, uh, so this is uh, so this failure to build a bridge with the Unionist Party was a very important political factor that uh, aided aided uh, partition. I know that when we talk of partition. And I find that many people have that perspective. There's a lot of bitterness, of course, because not many people see it necessarily as in depth as you do or try, even as you said, to learn as much so that they can understand themselves better. But when I was doing a little research, and of course, you've done some incredible interviews, I think the thing that really touches me and must be brought to light, as you have done in your book, is the stories of insaniyat of friendship, despite the darkness, despite the, the killings, despite the seeds of hatred that were sown. Just touch upon some of those beautiful stories of insaniyat that you discovered, Professor Gandhi, while you were researching your book on partition. Mm -hmm. And also just because I really believe it's important for us to always end with hope and we're not ending, we're going to go into questions soon. but. Do you think that there is a way forward, if there is a way forward? So first, to give one or two stories from those interviews we did, uh, my wife and I, in 2005, uh, in Lahore, but also in Delhi, uh, with uh, many people who had memories. And it was confirmed to us, we didn't talk about 2005, by so many pe people who remembered th those times, that helpers from the other side were much more numerous than those who disliked us. And as, really? I think as, as has been said, that those who protected fellow Punjabis outnumbered those who attacked fellow Punjabis. Hindus and Sikhs saved so many Muslim lives, Muslims saved so many Hindu and Sikh lives. Yes, if millions of people did leave one side to the other, how did they leave? Because they were enabled, helped by neighbors and friends to leave. So those who protected fellow Punjabis outnumbered number those who attacked or killed fellow Punjabis. That is point number one. And that's such a beautiful thing to hear, actually. Then, um, among the interviews, there was this very amazing interview we had with this lady in Lahore. She used to belong to Jalandak and her whole family. Uh, her, fam her husband's family, he was a leading doctor in Jalanda, Dr. Badruddin. And uh, so several members of her family had been killed in Jalanda. Uh, so my wife and I, we interviewed her. And she gave us the names of the people who had been killed. And you know, this is also true in all, both, both Punjabs, that many people who suffered a lot they're not willing to talk about their sufferings for a long time, even to their children or grandchildren, because it was too too uh, hurtful to talk. But also that uh, they were they, they had to restart their lives. So it was it was a time to to start something anew rather than to dwell on what had happened. So when I asked this lady about. Uh, 
Uh, her name is uh, Zuhra Rashid, uh, about her memories and what happened. So she named one by one, she named the person who had been killed in Jalandhar and then roughly the ages. It was very moving to hear that. And some other relatives of her were also there when we were asking questions. We're hearing this for the first time. Well, then to me, the most moving thing, and you know, when I speak about it, even now, I, I, I sometimes find it difficult uh, to, uh, to check my emotions. But she named the servants who killed. There was Idu, and there was his, Idu's wife, Fateh, and the five children of Idu and Fateh who were also killed. And you know, the reason why I was so moved when I heard the names of Idu and Fateh is this. We all know that the bulk of those who were killed in 47 were very poor people on both sides. Yes, many well-known, influential, well-off people also suffered. They suffered lots of loss of property. Right. Some of them suffered also loss of life. But the vast majority of the killed were the poor. And you know, we don't know their names. Uh, you know, when you go to the Vietnam Wall in Washington, DC, you see all those names and you can touch those names. We can't do that for 47. Because we don't, we say that lakhs of people were killed and indeed so, so many were killed, but we don't know their names. So when this Sukhra Rashid mentioned Idu and Fateh, to me, you know, that brought alive to me the, the reality, the truth, the sad, the bitter, painful truth of, of those killings. Uh, so anyway, this is, uh, and uh, so, uh, and her, her son, uh, Salman, was made visits to Jalandhar. And you know, he afterwards managed to meet somebody who was involved in the killing, you know, and he, he, he He's made several visits, several visits, several visits. It's an amazing story. And actually, uh, he, uh, his book is also published uh, uh, by Aleph, this book. Okay. Time of it's Madness. It's called The Time of Madness, Salman Rashid. Now, uh, but I tell you what uh, Sukhra Rashid told us. After all, you remember, so many relatives and family have been killed. But she said, Jab koi jalandar ki baat karta hai, to dil mein kuch ho jata hai. Can oh. you imagine? Can oh, you dude. imagine? So this is, this is Punjab. But you still, this is what I was saying to you, you still sense it. I mean, even now when you go, and I'll just share with you, when I went to Lahore, the friend that I'd stayed with a couple of times, and I was familiar with her house help and everyone. And this was the second time I was going and someone I didn't recognize came up to me and she asked me, she said, to see India to I said, Hanji. She just came and touched my face and he, she said, Bas vanu vekna si. and I wept because I just thought, oh my God, this love, this is the same reason I wanted to create a performance piece. I was telling someone, it's in our DNA memory. It is in our DNA memory, all of this love, all of the Punjabiyat you talk of, all of this. There are so many stories that people have covered of the good. And it is so wonderful to have you reiterate that point today of the fact that people had safe passage because more people helped others go, go to the other side. Um, unfortunately, just too much of the negative is highlighted versus some of the positive. And I also believe, I mean, your book is so important for us because we don't, as you said, in Vietnam, in, in the in the museum, in the memorial, that their names in the Holocaust Museum, there's a certain stature of a certain a certain weight that's given to this terrible happening. But in India, for some reason, we know it happened. We talk about it quite casually. Our history books don't cover it from any perspective other than just dates. So I think. It's so important that people buy your book and and understand more importantly, like you said, where it came from and to be able to understand ourselves better. Gunita, you popped up, put up a question. I'm sorry, I didn't see that. Could you put it up again uh, so that 
So, Dr. Gandhi, would you like me to read that or can you yeah, see I that? Can, I can read it. So, I'm being asked what school I went to. Well, it's a modern school, modern high school, well-known school, a privileged school. But yes, I had the privilege to attend that school. <laughs> that was a sweet question. Thank you. Yeah. Good preaching. So, yeah. Should I attempt to answer these questions now? Please, please do. Absolutely. So the question is, is everybody reading the question? Because Saraj was actually yeah, Raj yeah. of Punjab, six only 10 percent Muslim six, West Hindu lived in total harmony. Uh, well, then this is one way of looking at it. But you know, one thing to recognize that this amazing uh, Karl Saraj, all Ranjit Singh's uh, Raj, when it ended, there was unfortunately such division, such chaos. Right after he died, uh, and so it was uh, the the mutual killings, the intrigues were so tragic, so tragic. So this too is worth recognizing uh, that although there was they had it had these amazing qualities, all communities were taking part in it. But somewhere there was this uh, some some greed, some corruption, some uh, lack of. Uh, human understanding and uh, so so those who study it's there also in my book it's there in other books too the, the end of the Sikh uh, uh, kingdom in Lahore and Punjab uh, has a very uh, sad and un yes there was some treachery also the British were able to to win over some and some acted as spies of the British too it is so good. but nonetheless the intrigue the fellow fighting the infighting so many of them established connections with the British and are willing to be British uh, agents. So that's a sad part of the story. But yes, uh, the, the, the positive aspect of the Sikh rule is also should be remembered and honored. Anything else? Do you think Punjabis on both sides can play a major role? Yes, of course. So, you know, whatever governments can do, people to people, as as as, as Partition Archive is doing. I mean, Partition Archive and, uh, and Solanji, your own role, I am aware of, to some extent, of what you're doing. It is absolutely amazing. And so, yes, this has to continue. And I think Punjabis also want, uh, on both sides, to be really generous-hearted. And in the Punjab, they should include the Sindhis, they should include the Frontier Province, the Khyber Pakhtunwa, people, the Baloch people, together. And similarly, Punjabis and people in Delhi, people in Rajasthan, UP, Haryana, all of us have to, people to people, contacts, understanding, and we must keep the pressure on both governments to Absolutely. Relax, the, relax the visa restrictions to begin with. I, I think it was Kuldeep Nayarji who said uh, a long time ago in one of his interviews, he said, if we could live in peace at one point in time, you know, for hundreds of years. Why can't we do it now? Rashmani Singh says that you think an open border will ever be allowed to happen? Well, if enough people on both sides demand it, it will happen. If enough people on both sides keep demanding it, demanding it, demanding it, it will happen. And so and, and with all the restrictions, let us continue to make such, as, such contacts as are possible. And Nand Tandon says, is there an unbiased source of Punjabi history? I think you've just been listening to that, Nand. There is a ruler's version by their chroniclers, and there is a Hindu Sikh version based on the distorted collective memory. That's an interesting question, uh, Professor Gandhi. What are you going to say to that? Well, I think the, the point is, is correct. If uh, uh, Nand Tandonji uh, can find the time and to read my, my book, uh, uh, I think uh, it may be found that that book is at least attempting to be as advanced as possible. It's certainly very imperfect. But I hope that more and more people will seek in their own way the truth, the impartial truth of what happened. The pleasant truth, the unpleasant truth has to be found, has to be unearthed alongside a conviction that ultimately Punjabiyat and Insaniyat uh, must prevail. Yeah. Must prevail. No, and as you say, the only way, and I think this, the fact that, as you said, Partition Archives or you have done this, where we are taking oral histories or taking history that is not in our everyday 
purview or it's not in our books it must be taught to more children and it must be children must be exposed so that from history they learn for the future artika says this punjabiyat is visible abroad wherever indians and pakistanis live they connect and share stories and lives as friends uh, absolutely that is i i can confirm that from my own personal experiences but let me make one point uh, it is also important for us to read stories from the opposite point of view you know we read uh, yes ideally impartial people should read impartial stories but then the world is not like that there are many people who are partisans and there are many uh, selective histories but uh, hindus should read histories written by muslims and sikhs should read history and so forth so we should also read the opposite point of view uh, to know what we may have missed and I, i let me make one very obvious generalization but i think it may help some by and large we human beings we form opinions before we acquire knowledge <laughs> it's so true and and if we can acquire at least information even one sided information but if we acquire it from all sides and it may add up to something that is an approximation of what might have happened that's actually i think those are important words of wisdom to live by in general we form opinions of people we form opinions of of politics very very quickly um so thank you for that kapil asks why did khizrat tiwana resign after the british government announced transfer of power to indians in june 1948 he says what triggered his resignation well as i mentioned the khizr led coalition Uh, had congress had some sikh parties and it had a uh, segment of the unionist party that was left under his leadership but the vast bulk of the muslims of punjab were by this time persuaded by the muslim league that khizr tawana was a uh, really not an independent person and that the hindus and the sikhs were controlling him bulk of the muslims accepted this and compelled him and as i mentioned his own children said to him that in our school people say that you're not a muslim so this was the unfortunate reality that uh, khizr uh, lost support but uh, the, the british were also responsible the british had initially they were strong supporters of khizr after all he was a unionist right uh, but then they also following their you know churchill and others they wanted uh jina to be strengthened and khizr not to be strengthened so various parts also various international politics also played their part but by and large the attempt by the congress and the sikhs to enlist the unionists came too late in the day and so that's what triggered the resignation i don't know if we have any more questions i think we can take one more parul kapoor hinzan says from what i've read Jinnah's ambition to become leader of Pakistan drove the fight of the Muslim League in Punjab to create Pakistan. What is your view of Jinnah's role? I think this is an important question. Um, yes, well, Jinnah, uh, to begin with, had very little influence in Punjab. He had more influence in among Muslims in what became India uh, than in Punjab. But eventually, he managed to do this. he played his cards quite well towards the end and he managed to uh, get uh, really in effect the muslim league managed to ally itself with the unionists or to get the unionists to merge with the muslim league uh, and so uh, that was so there's no doubt that uh, punjab was a very tough challenge but uh, jinnah played his cards quite well and uh, but i think the, the, we have recognized that the failure of the hindus and sikhs in punjab and you might say of the national congress leadership or whatever uh, also contributed and eventually uh, that is that, that is what happened um, yeah uh, do we have any more questions i think we could take one more if there is another question i know i have many questions but we run out of time so and um, i know i have to wrap this up but honestly oh there you go do you have anything on the lohana community 
Well, Lohana community is a community in Gujarat, and it's true that Jinnah came from that community. But the story of Jinnah is a fascinating story. Uh, Jinnah, we know that Jinnah was a nationalist for a long, long time. Uh, but eventually, he decided that he would become a religious leader or a leader of, of the communal sense of, of Muslims alone. And uh, so, but the Lohana community is a community from which Jinnah came. I think his one or two generations before him, they converted to Islam. And they are a very important community in India today, the Lohana community. Thank you so much, Professor Gandhi. I do honestly wish this had been a three-hour session because I know that not just, I know many other people have questions. I know I have much to learn from you. Um, but I am today in front of everyone just going to sneak a promise out of you that you have to come back for another Sunday Stories session because I know we have so much more to, to ask you and, and to pick your brain and this reservoir of stories and history and just generosity of sharing wisdom that we want to take from you. We want to totally, you know, just, just literally soak in everything that you know. And this is 45 minutes, an hour is not enough to do that. I want to thank everyone who tuned in. I'm sure that you are feeling as enriched as I am. If you like the oral history work that the 1947 Partition Archive does and the mission that they are on, please consider making a donation of any size. The 1947 Partition Archive relies 100% on donations as an NGO. In some countries, donations are tax-free as well. And I think the links are in the description to this video. It's truly been absolutely fantastic, Professor Gandhi, to have you here. The honor of, of having someone like you share the wealth of your knowledge with us. So thank you so much for being here today. And I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you for your book. Thank you for spending all those years that you did sharing and learning and then giving to us. So thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Sanamji. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Sunday Stories. Please, I will let you. I would like to leave you to have the last word, Professor Gandhi. I just convey my best wishes to every every person. Thank you.